couple of years ago, a friend lent me a book, a very well-known book, called Religion and the Decline of Magic by Keith Thomas. It's a highly respected work, um, and it says on the back, Acclaimed analysis of the popular belief in England begins with the collapse of the medieval church and ends with the change in the intellectual atmosphere around 1700, in other words, sort of spanning the Enlightenment. Witchcraft, astrology, divination, every kind of popular magic flourished during this period. At the same time, men began to search for a scientific explanation of the universe, and so on, rather as in my description of the cycle of cultures. And so I found it a very interesting book to read. Now, at one point, quite early on, he talks about the sort of expectations that began to build up around the Catholic Church. Um, it was also inevitable to around the church, the clergy, their holy apparatus, there clustered a horde of popular superstitions which endowed religious objects with a magical power to which theologians themselves had never laid claim. And he gives examples, you know, that um, numerous po popular superstitions about the magical value of the communion silver as a cure for illness or a lucky charm against danger. Now, he talks about a change in the way people perceived it, it comes, and he illustrates it through the change in the nature of the communion service. By the later Middle Ages, the general effect had been to shift the emphasis away from the communion of the faithful and to place it upon the formal consecration of the elements by the priest. The ceremony thus acquired in the popular mind a mechanical efficacy in which the operative fact was not the participation of the congregation, who had become virtual spectators, but the special power of the priest. Hence the doctrine that the laity could benefit from being present at the celebration, even though they could not understand the proceedings. It was all in what the priest did. You didn't even have to understand what was going on. Um, he also says what stood out was the magical notion that the mere pronunciation of words in a ritual manner could affect in the change in the character of material objects. And he talks about this being taken to the point where people would steal things from the church in order to get that magical power. The communicant who did not swallow the bread but carried it away from the church in his mouth was widely to be in possession of an impressive source of magical power. He could use it to cure the blind or the feverish. He could carry it around with him as a general protection against ill fortune. Or he could beat it up into a powder and sprinkle it over his garden as a charm against caterpillars. And so on. This use of the word magical power, the idea that the wafer, holy water, say, could just cure someone, um, even if you'd stolen it from the church, without any willpower or belief or intention or extra ritual um, is described as magical but it isn't that is so wrong i don't know any magical tradition that doesn't involve human intervention and a lot of hard work if that was all that was needed then the magical culture would have evaporated. You wouldn't need witches, you wouldn't need sorcerers, you wouldn't need shamans, you wouldn't need cunning folk and all that. You just take the holy water to all the stuff. Anyone could do it. It just doesn't ring true. It's not about magic. Now, you might say, when I say magic is hard work, I'm taking a very sort of highfalutin, high magic point of view. But I, I really thought about this I, on the whole span, I cannot think of any magical tradition that does not involve hard work. I mean, begin with Crowley. The instructions for the AA, the mental exercise, things like that, are really tough. Go back to the Middle Ages, um, you know, uh, the fasting, the ritual, the getting virgin parchment and, you know, the tongue of a hanged man or whatever stuff was needed. Hell of a lot of work initially before you could get into that. Now I did the Abramelin operation. Compared with that, it's dead simple, you know, um, six months or more, um, depending on the system. Uh, and what you do is really very straightforward. Um, 
But, as I found out, it's incredibly difficult to keep it up. And the whole story of Abramelin is littered with people who said they were going to do it and then didn't complete it. It is hard work. Um, let's go to the extreme of New Age simplicity, the secret. You know, uh, there you are and, and, and you want to be rich, famous, and so you visualize yourself in your Ferrari, in your smart suit, whatever. Um, that's all you have to do. Well, the it, formula is simple, very simple, but still doing it is not easy. If you really think that you're a miserable loser, uh, to get into the mental state where you can visualize yourself with sufficient vividness, you know, being that, that in itself takes a lot of learning, a lot of work, a lot of practice. Okay, let's go into the fantasy realm then. Hogwarts, a Harry Potter. They will say a Latin phrase and something miraculous happens. Well, surely that is magical in this sense. No, it isn't. It misses out the fact that this is a school, you know, and they've had years of boring Latin lessons and, and um, tedious practicing and things like that. It's all, it's all there. All that lies behind it. It's still hard work. Well, what about the, um, what about the uh, sort of those systems which say, you know, there must be no lust for result, like Austin Spare, where you draw the sigil, then you must just simply forget. Now, even there, it is recognized that it is difficult to achieve that transition from the high level of gnosis required to charge that sigil to suddenly letting go of it. And Austin Spare talks about of exhaustion and um, the death posture, various techniques to try to make that transition. The transition itself takes enormous skill. Uh, finally, let's consider the sort of film ideal of the Zen master, you know, picking up the bow and arrow and saying there is no effort, there is no me, there is no thinking. I simply allow the arrow to find its target and it hits dead center. Wonderful. Um, no effort, no thinking. But of course we know in the story of that Zen master, he spent years as a, as a, a monk um, doing the most painstaking work before he could even be allowed to touch the bow, let alone practice doing it. So all along the line, and I'm not just talking about highfalutin um, magic as it ought to be, all along the line, I don't think you'll find any magical tradition that doesn't require a lot of work and a lot of commitment from the user um, to do it. And so the idea that you just steal a bit of host and does a cure, is not anything to do with magic, and yet we call it magical. So how is it Keith Thomas is so wrong? I know that um, some academics have a reputation for being able to study something for years and years and years and years in great depth without actually understanding it at all. But I don't think that was what's happening in this case. I think he was just slipping into a very common everyday use of the word magical. It's around now. Uh, you know, imagine the advertisement for um, the new floor cleaner. See filthy floor tiles and then psh, something is sprayed on and then just one wipe leaves you with this immaculate clean stripe through the middle of all the dirt. And they say, it's magical new cleaner. It works like magic. Um, you will get a, an email about uh, a magical new remedy, um, a herbal remedy that will cure all your aches or make you lose um, up to 10 kilogram over six months and so on and so forth. Works like magic, magical, magical. This is an expression that is used and it is for many people's idea of what magic is about. But as I've argued, it is nothing to do with magical thinking. So, this idea of the communion wafer curing, is it, if it isn't magical thinking, is it religious thinking? No, 
as Keith Thomas points out, the theologians didn't support this idea. Um, you see, holy water, okay, that's supposed to have healing properties, but it is through God's will. Uh, if you take holy water um, in the right um, respectful religious frame of mind, you are respecting the church and its traditions and that, and you hope thereby um, and honouring God that you will gain divine um, goodwill and then take it will cure you. It requires divine intervention. Just as magical things require human intervention, human will, human intention. So if it isn't magical and if it isn't religious, what is it? The answer to me is dead obvious. This is scientific thinking. The idea that the host could contain in it on its own right, without any religious intervention or uh, divine intervention or any human will, curative powers, that is a scientific idea, a scientific expectation. You see, taking healing, the double blind test, the person who does a double blind test on his product, uh, first of all, is ruling out divine intervention. It's nothing to do with that. But he makes special efforts to rule out human intervention, to rule out magical thinking. Firstly, you know, one blind is that the person taking it doesn't know whether they're taking it or not. And the second blind is the person giving it doesn't even know um, whether they're giving the medicine or not. The idea that the power could actually be in the pill itself rather than divine or human intervention, that is purely scientific. So what I see being described here, this transition from uh, the Medi, um, as I described in my thing about you know the sequence of cultures, the transition from the medieval religious thinking to scientific thinking means that a greater expectation that things are going to work automatically um, and that it's less and less emphasis on the group, the church, and um, the, the divine, and just the fact that holy water is itself a healing thing. Now, I'm not saying this is good scientific thinking. Obviously, it's rather, it's, it's misplaced scientific thinking, but it's an expectation that comes in the scientific culture. It's not to do with magic. You see, if I went to, I'll call him a scientist, and I said, look, I've got two problems, can you help me? And he says, okay. I said, well, the first problem is I've got these aches and pains in my fingers and it makes it very difficult to type, can you help me? And he will say, yes, take these tablets, they're painkillers, and that'll help you. And sure enough, you know, within a few hours, the pain has gone from my fingers. Marvelous, magical. Um, so, uh, my second problem is I've written a book and I can't get a publisher and I want it to be a bestseller. Can you give me a pill for that? And of course he can't. We're coming up against the edges of uh, a problem too complex for simple scientific solution. Now, does that mean that science just gives up? No, no. I'm sure that if I went to a library I could probably find a book the title something like the laws of scientific marketing or book selling and you know it would give me a lot of very good advice uh, on you know most popular typefaces the sort of themes one include what should go on the cover to um, uh, and statistical proof that this is the best way of going about it using google adverts and all that sort of thing um, each thing a, a bit of well attested well practiced well and tested um, advice, adding up to a sort of scientific help towards it. But when I read that book, I think, oh God, can I really have enough faith this is going to work that commit myself to all this work? Um, uh, will I be able to keep up the enthusiasm for the months of work uh, to carry on with this? And you see, I'm already moving into magical culture. 
the need for enthusiasm and belief and everything is coming into it. We're reaching the limits of science and we're moving into when you start needing magical thinking. So um, I, I see this transition being described as nothing to do with the rise of magical thinking. It is about rise of scientific expectations and um, that is what is being described. And this use of the word magical gives quite the wrong idea. And yet it is a very common use. And this, this is part of the problem, you see, because um, we have this common use of the word magical or like magic, describing something which is actually a scientific aspiration. An aspiration generated by scientific culture and the way, the sort of results it produces. And it's a misunderstanding and it's therefore a rather stupid use of the word. And the trouble is that it is how people see magic from the outside, whereas as soon as you get into it you realise that it's something quite different. But it has a bad effect because if you say publicly, I believe in magic or I am a magician, or I'm studying magic, people think that you are believing that stupid thing. They think you're aspiring to be able to sort of just say a Latin phrase and make wonderful things happen without any effort, that you can just sprinkle some powder and turn lead into gold. Um, and of course that's not at all what you're doing. And that's one of the problems that the magical culture has. This use of the word magic and magical really has so little to do with um, what is actually magical practice. Uh, there was a very good quote from um, Alistair Crowley's Book of Lies, which is about a more realistic idea of the magical path. Pilgrim talk. O thou that settest out upon the path, false is a phantom that thou seekest. You want to be able to do magic. When thou hast it, thou shalt know all bitterness, thy teeth fixed in the sodden apple. Oh, shit. Thus hast thou been lured along that path, whose terror else had driven thee far away. O thou that stridest upon the middle of the path, no phantoms mock thee. For the stride's sake thou stridest. Magic path becomes so fascinating itself begin to forget the results, you actually want to be doing it. Thus art thou lured along that path whose fascination else had driven thee far away. O thou that drawest towards the end of the path, effort is no more. Faster and faster dost thou fall, thy weariness is changed into an affable rest. For there is no thou upon that path. Thou hast become the way, like the Zen master with his bow and arrow. And so I think the next um, uh, talk I'll try to address the question of initiation.